Hi everyone, welcome again to the course of structural biology. We are going through the module of protein engineering. We are talking about strategies of protein engineering and today is a continuation of what I was talking about the rational protein designing. So, in short if I tell you rational protein designing is a designing of protein with logic. So, the designs are of different type. The most interesting part or most interesting division of rational protein designing is designing of completely novel protein. This would definitely be not of the part of the other methodology of protein engineering which is directed evolution because in directed evolution you are actually follow from a existing protein you mimicking nature. But in rational designing this is something which is really unique where we do not go for or do not bother about any experimental data, any nature's contribution. What we do? We design a protein from scratch. Our today's session will be mostly focused on this part. Another one is called blob level protein design where basically we take domains of different proteins, shuffle them and make a hybrid new protein. The third one is protein variants designing which is majorly used in various labs. These are taking a protein changing its amino acids through point mutation or through deletion making differential function making stability and all such small required changes. So, as I told today most of this class I will explain completely novel protein design or de novo design. As I told there would be no prior experimental information. Whatever some designer will do is to start from scratch. The protein could be designed ab initio on a computer. So, if you do not take any experimental information how you start? You will use prediction method and ab initio is a prediction method. We will talk about that in little details further, but not as details as it needs because it is not a modeling course. I have little opportunity, but I will try to explain it good enough so that you understand what I am trying to convey here, how it is related to the de novo design. So, the protein could be designed ab initio we could take the help of a protein structure prediction algorithm. There are different algorithms. We will talk about them. Take the help of protein structure fold prediction using the approach of machine learning. I will explain de novo protein designing with a very interesting story of Baker lab. I call it the story of KZ Ryan, but it actually involved many members of Baker lab. If you do not heard about David Baker is the, the person I will come with that who have helped us understanding protein designing de novo specially. And today's stories will show how Baker lab working. So, the story is not about older days as I start with histories in 1950s, 60s because protein engineering especially de novo protein engineering is a very, very recent field. So, the lady you are looking in the picture is Casey Bryan. Casey Bryan joined the protein design laboratory of David Baker in 2012 as a graduate student at the University of Washington Seattle. The first project she started was to design a protein that could bind to PD-1. What is PD-1? PD-1 is a protein on the surface of white blood cell that 
throttles the activity of the immune system. So, they want to make a protein which bind to PD-1 and by doing that they could do some immunotherapeutics. You know we are discussing protein designing, but if you go back and start considering the principle of protein structure and all, you will easily remember the thing I have repeatedly talked about is about the fold of protein which is a mystery and being a mystery we do not want to touch them you know you cannot bet your PhD career on something which is made by nature the smartest creator and the mechanism of protein folding is totally unknown. So, when you hear about protein designing most of the protein designing means taking a protein and altering it understanding the chemistry of the amino acid composition and altering. So, that was what KZ Bryan was doing he she tweaked an existing natural protein to make it to bind to PD-1, but unfortunately because if you look at the projects in David Baker's lab they are very challenging, they are very very creative, they are actually our fantasy. So, two years into her project she did not get any result and she decided or she understood that the project is not going anywhere by changing or designing or altering which we call redesigning an existing protein. In the meantime Baker lab was growing day by day being adept at a different approach instead of modifying natural proteins to fit a particular need they began to create protein from scratch. Although it could considerably harder than conventional protein engineering because as I explained the fold of protein people are working so much onto it for years, but still now we could not understand. So, it is harder, but when you start looking it from a different angle you understand that de novo protein designing also have many advantages. What are the advantages? So, first of all if you remember nature generally optimize the protein composition. So, it is always difficult to modify the natural protein most of the cases it leads to disrupting the overall structure protein denatured you did not produce the altered protein because the composition you make is breaking the optimization rule makes by nature. But if you consider making up a protein from scratch the researchers can design protein to be more forgiving there are better chances because what you are making is not optimized by someone. So, researchers could build enzyme with activities unknown to nature using cofactors, amino acids that are not part of the standard macromolecular toolkit. You could expand your toolkit and that is where the core of success of de novo protein designing hide through. And scientists can test their understanding of protein biology to ensure that they truly grasp the fundamentals. So, if you look at our course throughout the course we have come up with several techniques, but in one word we are trying to understand the fundamentals of protein and how to study them using different techniques be it high resolution technique like X-ray crystallography, cryo electron microscopy, NMR be it low resolution technique like spectroscopies, microscopies all are focused on one fact that we want to understand the fundamentals. When you do de novo designing you do not have to be restricted with the optimization nature made you are more free to use the fundamental knowledge you gain as a designer. So, that is one fact which make protein designer like us 
very very excited to go for de novo protein designing. So, as I told according to the man in the field of de novo protein designing, the name is David Baker, we made a very strict rule in the lab. So, they made very strict rule in the lab, anyone, any researcher in the lab is not allowed to start with anything that exists in nature, because we wanted to be able to sure we understand everything and design everything from basic principle of science correlating to a protein's hierarchical architecture. So, they are not dependent on any previously made designing, they want to use the knowledge of amino acid, their interactions, covalent interaction, non-covalent interaction, the interaction with metals, the interaction with cofactors, all those fundamental principle of physics and chemistry and want to apply them to come up with a new product, a new protein. The most interesting part of that in what they got in Baker's lab, the artificial proteins most of them are rocks. That means, mostly they are ultra stable protein as they got I have shown you in the previous class about top 7. This is a protein which was designed in David Baker's lab from scratch, so that there is no existing fold like this made in nature, but the other part of it David Baker lab has experienced that all of these de novo design proteins are ultra stable that is very exciting. Though de novo designing is getting considerable importance, so and standing there in 2012-13, though a lot of people are thinking about de novo designing, but still it was minority and according to David Baker, 95 to 99 percent of protein engineering is still done by random mutagenesis and selection which is directed evolution. If you remember in 2018, Francis Arnold got Nobel Prize because of that. I will come to that in the next class. De novo protein designing or protein engineering often requires weeks of computational time and months of iteration on it. With computational advances and a broadening, user base is making the process more accessible now. So, with day by day computational power increasing, the protein designing is becoming much more possible. As told by Donald Hilbert, who is a protein chemist at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology ETH Zurich, he termed this area is going through a tremendous time. Donald Hilbert also worked with Brian Kuhlman to create novel enzymes called esterases. If you do not relate to Brian Kuhlman, he is the researcher who in David Baker lab have developed the first de novo enzyme the top 7 which I just talked about. So, it is a dream come true to many of us as the combination of computation, structure, molecular biology, detailed biophysical measurements, all of this is coming together in such a beautiful way to create such wonders in the form of protein which is never available to or created by nature. If I go to a previous generation of mine who are crystallographers, people used to ask us what is your core expertise? You could do cloning, overexpression, purification, biophysical, biochemical characterization, kinetics, crystallography, in silico. So, actually what you want, what is your core expertise in one word? We say we are protein designer, but in recent years actually when people are doing protein designing by directed evolution or by mutagenesis, you do not need so many things, so many expertises. But now with de novo protein designing become more and more popular, people like me could 
stand on a firm platform and proudly say that we are protein designer. So, we could use the knowledge of computation, the expertise of computation, the expertise of structure determination, the expertise of basic molecular biology, the expertise to do detailed biophysical experiments and a good background of chemistry makes me a candidate as a protein designer. So, if you remember throughout the course I was talking about that it was long known that protein folding is complicated built as long chains of amino acids newly from proteins quickly collapse into a specific folded shape from which the molecules derive their function. So, the researchers have long known that a protein sequence defines its shape. If you remember I starts with a virtual experiment and if you do not remember I want you to go through this. This is the amazing experience to understand protein. What you have to do? You close your eyes first. Okay? Now, when you close your eyes you start imagine. What you have to imagine? You have to imagine that in front of you there is a bowl which is filled up with 20 different color pulse and then in your hand there is a string. So, do not no 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 do not do not open your eyes continue picking up. So, you close your eyes and continue picking up randomly the pearls different color pulse and put it on the string to make a necklace. Okay? So, you have the necklace that is protein and now what you have to do? If you move the protein depending on the shape of the pearls because every pearls is different and differently shaped, they have different dynamicity. So, now you give it a shape and that is the 3D structure. So, researchers especially you guys my students you know that you could experimentally determine that 3D shape with the use of X-ray crystallography, NMR and cryolactron microscopy and if you need to correlate to the function you could do that by low resolution spectroscopy techniques. But what we do not know is how predict the shape from sequence. So, if there is a sequence you could make a structure, the structure will give you function. But what we do not know that to predict the shape from sequence, sequence to structure. Why? Why is that happen? To answer these we have to go back to the fundamentals of proteins as I taught you uh, as major part of which was we, we discussed in the previous lit literatures. So, so, the main reason is a protein structure is defined by multiple computing forces. You have the string, you have to take the string to a shape. What you need in case of protein, you need so protein make this string through covalent bond. But now you need a lot of non covalent bond. Do we know this non covalent bond? Yes, we know this non covalent bond. So, what we do not know how they are distributed, when they are forming, when they are breaking, because of so many factors it becomes very complicated and we call it a mystery. So, as I told the protein is basically a long string of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and hydrogen with amino acid side chain dangling like chumps on a molecular necklace. You just made it. The molecule cannot fold into just any shape. However, the possibilities are constrained as different parts of the protein jostle for position and balance attractive and repulsive forces. The forces like hydrogen bond, a bond individually 
have very very less contribution but they come with many they form and break in every moment salt bridges few of them but very strong effect van der waal hydrophobic interactions base stacking metal affinity binding. So, to understand the trick in protein folding prediction is to work out those forces and thus the precise angles and the protein bonds will take how the amino acid would form, how the angles would be and more importantly how the dihedrals would be present. So, we need the bonds, bond stretching, bending, dihedral. We need non-bonded which I have already talked about, non-bond, all of them are non-bond. To make it from scratch one need a molecular modeling package along with a search tool means along with optimization. When you do molecular modeling it need to be scored, it need to be optimized. So, you need a package. So, what would be the possible properties of such a tool package? In other word how you will find which programs are good. One of the process is CASP ranking. What is CASP? CASP is critical assessment of protein structure prediction. CASP is a community wide worldwide experiment for protein structure prediction taking place every two years since 1994. They also do scoring for the popular structure prediction packages and announce an yearly or bi-yearly ranking which a part of which I am showing here. Two things I would like you to look at. So, these are group names you could see, these are domain count, these are Z score that means like how many they are making and more they are making increasing Z score, uh, rank some of the Z score. So, the Z score is enhancing when you model more structure, when you model correct structure, then rank, then average G score and rank average G score. So, you see the Jang server is coming one and you will see Baker, just now I talked about David Baker, so Brosetta server. So, these are two very popular packages. So, two of them, Chang server is also named popularly as ITASER and David Baker server is also popularly named as Rosetta are mostly popular. So, to understand de novo protein designing, you have to understand that. But before that, I would also like to talk about something which is the protein structure prediction methods. There are several type of protein structure prediction methods. One of them are knowledge based method which is the most common and popular method. Definitely this is not a course of protein modeling, but protein modeling is very very related to structure. So, I would like to introduce them, but I would not go into details. So, who are the knowledge based method? One homology modeling, if you remember I have talked about homology modeling when I was teaching X-ray crystallography structure solution solving the phase problem, I was talking about molecular replacement. What is conceptually done by molecular replacement in experiment? The extension is homology modeling. What you do here? You have a existing structure you take the sequence of the structure. So, what you do? You have sequence of a unknown protein. Okay. 
you want to you have a I would say sequence A. You want to make a structure of this sequence. So, what you do you search blast is basic local alignment search tool is a wonderful method to search a related sequence. So, through blast search you want to search a sequence B which is definitely related to sequence A, but that is not the only criteria to searching out sequence B. The another and must criteria to select se sequence B would be sequence B have 3D structure in PDB database if you remember. So, when you do blast you put a condition that search PDB search RCSB PDB database. So, we know every sequence who are deposited in RCSB PDB have structure related to that that is why they are in the PDB protein data bank. So, if you get a sequence B related to sequence A in the PDB it would have a structure. We will use this structure to predict a model of sequence A. This is the process which we call homology modeling. Homology modeling is good for 40 to 100 percent identity. Below 40 there is a problem now with the availability of more and more structures we could go lower, but below 25 it is very difficult. And when it goes to an information where you get a related structure with a sequence with identity lower than 25 percent you use this more method. So, that time homology did not work and you go for fold recognition. Fold recognition is a very interesting method while we are talking about ab initio prediction this is not ab initio prediction, but here you need some computational determination. So, I will talk little details about this. Another method is called energy based method. Energy based method is very conceptual and you would understand. What we think when the protein is open the thermodynamic energy is highest. You push it to lower energy you get folding. It is thought that when it would have lowest energy the protein would be completely folded. So, that is basically energy based method you perform energy minimization and there are if you look at a protein there would be I have already talked about there are local minimas and global minima. So, gradually by minimizing energy or pushing the macromolecule the protein towards more folded state here that is your goal. And the last one is what we talk about designing from scratch this method talks about designing from scratch ab initio method. It is a solution of a protein folding problem search in conformational space. When you apply ab initio method when you have even not able to apply both of these method the homology modeling and fold recognition. I hope I could give you a basic intro. Now, I will talk a little bit about as I promised about fold recognition or protein threading. So, this is a problem where you have a sequence of an unknown structure and it does not 
have a exact match more than 40 percent with any of the protein, but it have local matching with many proteins. So, this is the sequence which I talk about and there are different parts of this sequence which match with the different part of different protein. So, if you make library by chopping like all these proteins and now you chop your sequence and this fragment of sequence you send them to be matched with all the folding library, you get candidates, you assemble it by optimizing and develop a new structure. So, there are different folds who are asking, may I help you? May I help you to develop the structure? And the process is called fold recognition. So, in other words, a protein fold recognition technique involves incrementally replacing the sequence of a known protein structure with a query sequence of unknown structure. So, you have a query sequence, we chop them and then allow it to match. So, this match, so we get this structure part, then other one match and all. But this is done by a heuristic method where continuous matching is done. So, first as I told a protein fold recognition technique involves incrementally replacing the sequence of a known protein structure or set up actually with a query sequence of unknown structure. The new model structure is evaluated using a simple heuristic measure of protein fold quality. The process is repeated against all known 3D structure until an optimal field is found. So, one of the challenge of this method is here you need an optimal fit and it is very difficult to actually score it. Why? Because you know judging needs criteria. You may ask who is better between you and me? There is no specific answer, but if you ask who is a good batsman between us, who is a good bowler between us, who is a good runner between us, who is a good educated person between us. There might be that are also apparent, there are complexities, but there are some parameters. So, when to score, especially when to score something which we do not understand, like here is a fold it is very difficult to score them to compare them and that is one of the big problem of protein threading where a lot of new computational work is going on. Coming to ab initio method, one of the easiest definition you have to provide for anything this is ab initio method, why? You have sequence you have to convert it to structure by a method, the method is called ab initio. So, if you have to take the sequences and predict the structure that is ab initio. So, the field is of great theoretical interest, but so far of very little practical applications. Here there is no use of sequence alignment, no direct use of known structure, experimental informations and all. The basic idea is to build empirical function that simulate real physical forces and potential of chemical contacts. For example, you have bonded interaction and non-bonded as I told. Now, you already remember in simulation using classic physics, we have developed a equation and we try to solve it. That is how model developed. The same thing we have to do, but when we do it with classic physics, a lot of assumption leads to a lot of error. So, classic physics is a problem 
when we have problem in classic physics the obvious look is to quantum mechanics. So, is it possible to develop quantum mechanical equation of physical force and potential of chemical contacts and simulate them? Yes and no. Yes means for small number of amino acids. Yes, quantum mechanics is possible, but for large number of amino acids, large number, no, because you will see you could have start calculating the number of electrons. So, when you have amino acid So, here you could calculate hydrogen 3, nitrogen 7, carbon 6, if we consider this as smallest not glycine, but alanine then 9, 1, 6, 8. So, from this bond you get 10, 16, 25, 26, 30 to 40. Now, up to 25 amino acid you get around 1000, it could be little less than that, but this is possible. So, up to 25 amino acid it is possible, more than that the cross connection of the electrons makes the complication make the calculation very very difficult right so it's a possibility but there are problems so if we will have perfect function we develop a perfect function and we will be able to scan all the possible conformation then we will be able to detect the correct fold now in ab initio this method predicts structure of protein when fold recognition definitely homology both fail. As I told it requires a free energy function sufficiently close to the true potential a method for searching the conformational space. Advantage of this method is it works for novel fold even when we are doing theory we had no idea that we could come up with novel things. We do theory based on our experimental finding. So, actually in theory our most of the cases our target was to match up with the experiment, but with this that is the reason this is a very very exciting field and as I told in de novo protein designing this is creating a very strong role. So, it works for novel folds and disadvantage it is applicable to short sequences only as I have told you. There are two software packages. So, ab initio or working from scratch or de novo modeling can be done using two protocols or two packages one is ITASR and another is Rosetta, but through our already looking through CASP ranking we have identified them. So, let us take a look what these guys are. So, to start with ITASR because you have remembered it was there in the top ranking. So, what is a ITASR and how it works? ITASR, why it called ITASR? Iterative the I comes from there, threading assembly refinement. So, it comes from threading T, iterative I, threading T, S, C, R, I, tasser. 
it is a hierarchical approach to protein structure prediction and structure based function annotation. So, it not only predict the structure after predicting the structure it correlate the structure to the function. You will be amazed to know that recent data shows that server completed prediction of 6 lakh 732 proteins. So, they have predicted 6 lakh 732 protein structure already, which was submitted by 1 lakh 144,145 user from 154 countries. That is the strong use of this software. It first identifies structural templates from the PDB by multiple threading approach LOMETS with full length atomic model constructed by iterative template based fragment assembly simulations. Functional insight of the target are then derived by a re-threading the 3D model through protein function database which is BioLeap. As I told before, ITASER as Chang server was ranked as the number one server for protein structure prediction in recent community wide CAS 7, CAS 8, CAS 9, CAS 10, CAS 11, CAS 12, CAS 13 and CAS 14 ranking. So, most of the or all of the ranking you could say. The server is in active development with the goal to provide the most accurate protein structure and function prediction using state of the art algorithms. Here is the link if you like you could go back and check it. So, how ITASER actually work? As we already know it starts from the sequence. So, if you want to predict the structure, the step 1 is you provide the sequence. Okay? If you remember when I was talking about these packages, I talked about threading because in my mind I knew that I am coming to the principle of ITASER where they include threading. So, what they do? they chop those sequences and then they match it and they make optimized template structure. So, the first step is getting the sequence, then chop the sequence, match them through threading and coming to the template. Now, what is there in the template? If I approximate the template have alpha helices connected by a loop like the possibilities I am talking about like this. Now, we cut all the loop connections what we get? We get the secondary structures. Why? Because we know that the secondary structures are more stable and easily achievable. So, and the loops are mostly organized with the possibility of wrong connections. So, we have taken out the loops. So, what we have now? The secondary structures without connection which we call template fragments. Now, we want to bring them and we connect them and we apply here the ab initio. How? Remember in ab initio, we have to bring a function. For function, you need a criteria. Our criteria is we have a, an alpha helix, we have a beta sheet, we are connecting them with the possibility that this connection would not create steric hindrance. So, we apply 
contact restraint to develop decoy based optimized potential. The function is contact restraint predicting decoy based optimized potential. So, all the possible combinations are allowed where the connections are not coming into steric classes. We get a huge structure assembly here. Now, what we do? So, we do the fifth step and now we are on the sixth where we have a lot of structure assembly. Now, we will do or we will take help of a very interesting statistical method which is called clustering. What is clustering? Let us say you have a 2D place. You pick up any of the structure, any of this structure from the assembly and randomly put it somewhere. So, you put this structure A and you put it here. Now, you call structure B and do a alignment using RMSD, root mean square deviation. So, you do a RMSD and depending on that you put the other one here. Then you take C and again you compare and put it here. By this way you will keep putting it differently and you will see that in one place you get a dense distribution. Like if you look at here, you get a very dense distribution here. Why you get it? Because if you remember I told you make this permutation and combination, you allow the steric class not going to happen. So, with that you have more chances to get the permutation of combination towards the right fold and that would be much more populated. The right conformation would have much more population, you get it. If you carefully take a look in the clustering presentation, though it is a apparent presentation, you might argue that this is also dense, it is very possible. It might happen that this is the conformation of the thermodynamically most stable, but this might be another conformation. So, you could pick up from here, you could pick up from here as well and you could develop two models, there is no problem with that. But what is interesting here, now from millions of conformations, millions of structure assembly, you just concentrate into two clusters and if you look at a lot of them are there, so it covers a good area and now what you take is cluster centroid a apparent center. But when you take apparent center, you might not hit the exact center. So, you take the restraint from the cluster centroid and you make again a ab initio. So, in the seventh step, you are doing clustering, in the eighth step, you get the cluster centroid, you in the ninth step, you do again ab initio. But this time, your variations are more between the actual conformation. So, you get relatively much, though the two pictures kind of representing similar population, but this population is much less than these as well as the structures are with very less RMSG. So, in the 10 you have the structure assembly, in 11 what you do? You do minimization, energy minimization, 
and then when you get the optimized structure in the step 12 you add the rotamers adding by the rotamer library made by pulsa and scroll and in 13 you have the final model. So, how I tesser work the fact I want to make your focus make your attention we told that the process is made by ab initio right. But if you see there is threading, there is statistics, there is energy minimization, there is rotamer library involvement. So, that is what I am trying to say developing one ab initio does not make the thing successful, it needs the help of other methods. So, though I tesser and Rosetta are like called as ab initio method, they are basically of everything. So, collection of methods are included in the package giving more flexibility to the program and help achieving accuracy in prediction. Continuous improvement and updating is going on and the data we have presented you tells us that the software is updated on 20th March 221. There are some additional thing to show you that how this continuous updating is going on. This is what we talked about classic ITASER, but in addition to the classic ITASER pipeline, several approaches were recently developed and integrated into ITASER to enhance its ability to of structure modeling for distant homology targets. What is distant homology targets? As you could understand when those methods were first started they are applied to the easy targets. So, all the easy possible modeling are done. Now, we have to do the difficult modelings this we call distant homology targets. At the first like the top models generated by the quark ab initio folding. So, if you remember from sequence if we go to the slide you see the sequence were directly threaded, but if you remember in threading we chop the sequence. So, we get small sequences and from our previous knowledge of this class we know that small sequence could be directly made structure using ab initio. So, that is where here happened the top models generated by quark ab initio folding. So, you chop it you do go for threading, but you also make structures through quark ab initio and you merge them to the template pool which were used as the starting confirmation of ITASA simulation. Since the hard targets generally lack global templates, the sequence were broken into segments of 2 to 4 consecutive secondary structure elements. So, you have the entire sequence I already talked about chopping, they have tools which help to already break into segments consecutive secondary structure elements which were then threaded through the PDB by the segmental threading tool sigma 9 to identify super secondary structure motif. If you remember I talked in details about the super secondary structures and their importance in modeling super secondary structure directly talk about the function. So, that is the thing used here. SBM sec and SP con are used to generate residue contact map. So, these are machine learning program I was talking about these are AI based prediction here SBM sec and SP con is used to generate residue contact maps which are further utilized in structure prediction. For multiple domain proteins I have shown you already that there are proteins which are with multiple domains and they are big and they are difficult to model. A program threadom is developed to predict the domain boundary and 
linker regions. There are many more, but these are few examples to see how continuous updating is developing and making the program better and better. Now, we go to Rosetta structure prediction server, which is also called Rosetta Commons nowadays. The Rosetta software should include algorithms for computational modeling and analysis of protein structures. It has enabled notable scientific advances in computational biology including de novo protein design as we talked about and we are going to talk about enzyme design, ligand docking and structure prediction of biological macromolecules and macromolecular complexes. Rosetta development began in the laboratory of David Baker at the University of Washington as a structure prediction tool, but since then it has been adapted to solve common computational macromolecular problems. Development of Rosetta has moved beyond the University of Washington into the members of Rosetta Commons include government laboratories, institutes, research center and partner cooperation. So, here I just add one thing, why or how these programs are so good? Yes, Rosetta was started with David Baker, right? As I told and I Tasser was started by Zhang. But then let us say David Baker have the, his PhD postdocs. So, they are taking a part of the problem and they are including again PhDs and postdocs to do that. In that way, though it started with David Baker and the team. Now, at least there are more than 1000 workers, 1000 worker means 1000 postdoc PhDs and all who are continuously working with Rosetta. Similarly, from Chang lab, it is coming to different other labs and day by day more and more people are involved in making or upgrading those packages. So, that is one of the reason of success of these two software packages because day by day more and more efficient people are joining this team and working continuously. Coming back to Rosetta structure prediction, the Rosetta community has many goals for the softwares such as understanding the macromolecular interactions, designing custom molecules developing efficient ways to search confirmation and sequence space, finding a broadly useful energy function for various biomolecular representations. How Rosetta server actually work? I will talk about it quickly because I have explained the basic principle in ITASR. This is same. So, you take the target sequence and then you make profile profile alignment by making the fragment library as you make in threading. Then you apply the knowledge base potential and you come to phase 1 where you apply Monte Carlo fragment assembly. If you remember I talk about Monte Carlo not in details, but in simulation if simulation gives you a movie of a butterfly flying Monte Carlo gives the high resolution picture of the confirmations which are good enough to explain the flying mechanism of that butterfly. That is the basic difference between Monte Carlo simulation and classic MD simulation. You understand? If you see a butterfly flying, the whole flying mechanism you will obtain through MD simulation in Monte Carlo you will find the high resolution pictures of the confirmations of that butterfly which is good enough to explain the whole flying mechanism. From using Monte Carlo you come to the low resolution model and then you make physics based atomic refinement. Now, as you have already gone through in details in X-ray crystallography in partial in cryo-electron microscopy, you know what is atomic refinement, you know the 
library parameters, the bond angle, the bond distance, the dihedrals and everything and based on them you do energy minimization to match that, that is called refinement and you do the refinement and you come to the final atomic model. So, as I told the principles are pretty similar to ITASER, but they have developed their own algorithms and these especially Rosetta is extremely successful for de novo protein designing project. Coming back to the story I was talking about, the Baker lab uses a suit of molecular modeling and search tool which is called Rosetta which we talked about which can calculate the energy of a folded protein and search for the lowest energy sequence for a given structure or the lowest energy structure for a given sequence that is the beauty of the program. David Baker developed Rosetta in the late 1990 as a tool for predicting structure. The software has been under continuous development ever since both by member of his lab and a community of several hundred users called the Rosetta Commons to improve its performance and capabilities. But you already know the background as I have explained it separately. For instance, in a project to design short circular peptide called macrocycles which can have antibiotic and anti-cancer properties. So, in a project which designed short circular peptide called macrocycles which can have antibiotic as well as anti-cancer property, Baker lab postdocs Parisa Hossein Jada, Gaurav Bharadwaj and Vikram Muligan collaborated to te teach Rosetta how to handle D amino acids. If you know there are different chirality of amino acids and it is selected for one which is not D. So, they have trained the Rosetta how in addition to L it could handle D amino acids. Although each de novo project is different according to David Baker the man in their group they all follow the same basic strategy to design a de novo protein. What are the strategy? First decide on a desired class of structures a platonic detail of a shape as he puts it. So, they first try to get an idea which shape of the protein they want to achieve. Then they use Rosetta to design tens of thousand of potential backbone conformation to match that shape flesh those out with side chain residues. So, first what they do? They first get to optimize the backbone. Backbone means the main chain and then include the side chain and then test that the calculated sequence will fold into the desired form. Finally, the synthesized genes that will express the base designs test, iterate and repeat. Experience of their work bring to following comment that only a very small fraction of possible backbone conformations are actually designable. And to achieve those lucky ones, those few ones, researchers might need to search through millions of possibilities and dozens of physical proteins before selecting the right candidate. Jibo Chen, a work to example, a graduate from the Baker lab who is now at the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena, sifted through some 87 million backbones to identify 2251 designs that are capable of protein-protein interactions. The computation took about 6 weeks on several hundred processors course. So, this is what you are getting now, several hundred processor course. To further explain Jibo Chen's work, let me introduce you to DNA origami. DNA origami is a very interesting thing. If you look at the structure, there are many DNAs together. So, DNA origami is the nanoscale folding of DNA to create arbitrary two and three dimensional shapes at the nanoscale. As you know, DNA is a 1D nanomaterial. If you take small fragments, you make it a 0D nanomaterial. Now, you could develop DNA origami 
where they would be coming together. The key to this is the specificity of the interaction between complementary base pairs make DNA a useful construction material through design of its base sequence. As you know, we understand the structure of DNA as explained in the previous classes. It is a well understood material that is suitable for creating scaffolds that hold other molecules in place or to create structure all on its own. Now, Jivo was inspired with by the DNA origami uh, in which DNA molecules are folded into nanostructure. He wanted to identify hydrogen bonding strategies that would allow him to design perfectly orthogonal protein pairs, protein that would interact only with a specified artificial partner, but not with other similarly designed proteins. So, it would be very specific. He wants to design specific proteins. Such proteins could be used to create novel biosensors, genetic circuits or just a unique shape. Chen joined the lab, he says, partly because he wanted to see whether he could recreate with protein what DNA nanotechnologists had made with nucleic acids, a macromolecular smiley face emoji. Earlier in 2019, Chen described the first step towards such a design, a self-assembling 2D array of the protein. I was quite naive about what I could achieve in 5 years, he says. On the other hand, Brian designed her protein, a 46 amino acids of it, which is a tiny protein in normal standard of 250 amino acid being an average size of the protein, to interface with and he hopefully uh, he was hoping that it would bind or regulate PD-1. The protein in her language is simply a flat surface, a beta sheet scaffolded by a single rod like alpha helix. In cartoon form, it resembles an old fashioned iron used to press the clothes. The helix is kind of like a handle and the actual functional end is the iron that sticks to the receptor. She explained. Brian first tried to modify an existing protein to assume that shape, but found she could not produce the protein in a usable form. So, inspired by the known structure of PD-1 binding to its natural ligand PDL2, she identified three crucial residues, coded their positions into Rosetta and directed the software to build a protein that would support it. She extended an essential loop by 5 amino acids to improve binding to the human target and using a high throughput screening strategy based on flow cytometry, a cell analysis technique which will be used to check the binding and DNA sequencing. She tested every amino acid variant at every position to nudge the structure towards ever stronger interactions. On the way to designing her protein, Brian received her degree despite a three year detour when she realized that her engineered protein could not interact with its human counterpart owing to some crucial sugar modification. But finally, Brian had a breakthrough, the protein bound to lymphocyte in a flow cytometer which was the actual target to start with. With so many ups and downs, Brian was skeptical of reading too much into any one experiment as she says, but those flow data provided by her immunology colleagues made her believe it was this immunology collaborator who know T cells really well and they were telling me that on real human T cell from real people, we saw this strong effect that had not really been seen before with the similar molecules which are present in nature. Protein designer Neil King, a Baker Lab alumnus who is still at the University of Washington had modified Rosetta to design self-assembling protein nanoparticles. This designed self-assembling nanoparticle by King could serve as a candidate vaccine for respiratory syncytial virus 4 describes shepherding a molecule from concept to reality as surreal. You are making it up, he says, it is literally a computer fantasy. And when it actually works in the real world, it is just magical. It is a feeling 
of being into the shoes of mother nature. That is the beauty of de novo protein designing and a small story of the Baker lab people who have actually we would say founded the field of de novo protein designing. So, if we come back to my initial slide, I talk about completely novel protein design. Now, we will talk about blob level protein designing and protein variant designing. Blob level protein designing, it is the basic idea is to combine protein units of defined function to engineer a fusion protein with novel functionality. Examples include sensors, signal transduction components, transcription factors, therapeutics, etc. Suppose you design a sensor like that, which could bind to there are calcium binding sites here, which change the switching. If you see these two are the calcium binding domains. So, when calcium binds, they change their conformation and binds to these and that develop a new switch. So, in one side there is calcium binder, in other side there is a fluorescence protein. So, it is not fluorescing, it is fluorescing that is how the chimeric protein or fusion proteins are made by getting different domains. This is a GFP based approach extended to other sensors freight relation. So, you have yellow fluorescence protein, you have cyan fluorescence protein, you use the kinase activity. So, it phosphorylates here, then it binds here and these two come together and shows freight signal. Also, there are engineering antibodies. If you look at engineering antibodies like antibodies, they have the constant heavy chains and they have variable chains where they have complementary determining regions. So, if you pick up those, you could develop a nanobody with a single protein which is 15 kilodalton. If you connect these two, you will get a divalent domain. If you use some nano body which develop a pentamer, then you get a 128 kilodalton assembly. So, these are as we call them single chain nanobodies. Similarly, you use the binding domain of leucine zipper like in this uh, June and FOSS is used and you develop bispecific nanobodies. So, like that you could take domains and you could combine them. So, rational protein designing it is knowledge based deterministic engineering of protein with selection for desired properties novel characteristics. Designing modeling of the novel protein generate required DNA construct by genetic engineering. Then you over express protein, then you purify protein and then you do the analysis. So, you first do the designing we have talked all about designing, but when you are working with suppling domains, uh, it is not as challenging as we talked about de novo designing, but you have to do the designing. Then when you have the designing, you have to do genetic engineering, which means you need proper plasmid, you need expression vector, you need to include over expression related strategies, how they will induce, you need purification strategy all in the plasmid. Then you will get a host to get good over expression of the protein. The protein should over express because if you do it let us say in E. coli as a known system E. coli have around 5000 proteins. So, you have to make your protein exclusively expressed. Once it is expressed you have to purify it. 
there are many purification strategies I have already told. Once you get the purified protein, you have to go for assays which will tell that the desired function for which you do the designing is present or not. Protein engineering at high resolution. So, when you go to high resolution, you could look at the atomic details very nicely. You could alter or tune properties of proteins by making structurally or computationally informed changes at the amino acid level. In some cases, you produce deletion mutation for protein based on prediction of structure and function from amino acid sequence. It could be rational when combined with structural information or computational modeling approaches. You do the designing then to get the actual construct, you have to perform mutagenesis. Mutagenesis is a process which change in DNA sequence because you know uh, I have talked about earlier whenever you want to make any change in the protein, you have to do it in the DNA level. There are different type of mutations, point mutations, large modifications, insertions or deletions or point mutations with directed mutagenesis like substitution change of one nucleotide. For example, adenine to cytosine insertion gaining one additional nucleotide deletion loss of one nucleotide. So, these are the consequences of point mutation within a coding sequence. It could be uh, you have the wall type sequence where you have the DNA sequence, mRNA sequence and amino acid sequence. It could be a missense mutation, it could be a nonsense mutation, it could be a frame shift by addition of a nucleotide or it could be a frame shift by making a deletion. What are the results? So, you could get silent mutations, change in nucleotide sequence with no consequence of protein sequence. You could make change of amino acid, there is a truncation of protein where stop codon is introduced change of C terminal part of the protein, change of N terminal part of the protein, all those are possibilities through mutation. You also have to understand the codon usage in different in different species. So, suppose you want to express a protein from human homo sapiens to a standard system E. coli system, here the codon table of E. coli is given, here the codon table of homo sapiens is given. So, why we need different codon tables? If you remember, we told about codons, codons are 3 nucleotides, let us say ATG, which talks about an amino acid. The problem is not when it is ATG, because ATG is a single one to code methionine, but there are codons which code for one protein multiple codons because if you see there are 64 codons and 3 stop codons. So, there are 61 codons for 20 amino acids. So, few amino acids have 6 codons, few have 4, few have 3, few have 1 in that way. And that is why for one organism, one though that amino acid have multiple codons, but one codon is maximally coming and that is called codon optimization or codon usage in different species. Coming to the general strategy for directed mutagenesis, Site directed mutagenesis, it is a molecular biology method that is used to make specific and intentional changes to the DNA sequence of a gene and any gene product. So, you have the gene, you want to change one amino acid, you change the nucleotide and then you proceed with that is called site directed where you direct the mutation in a specific site. It is also called site specific mutagenesis. It is used for investigating the structure and biological activity of DNA, RNA, protein molecule and especially for protein engineering. 
Site directed mutagenesis is one of the most important laboratory technique for creating DNA libraries by introducing mutation into the DNA sequences. There are numerous methods for achieving site directed mutagenesis, but with decreasing cost of oligonucleotide synthesis, artificial gene synthesis is now occasionally used as an alternative. So, you do not do mutation on an existing gene, rather you synthesize the new gene with the altered sequence. So, if you see you have the plasmid, then you do in vitro mutagenesis and you then select through culturing and you get the library of mutant plasmids. Requirements for directed mutagenesis, uh, DNA of interest, the gene or promoter region that should be cloned first then expression system must be available. So, that after change we express it, we could see expression system would be required for testing phenotypic change, you make a change then you want to see the effect you need a expression system. What are the application of directed mutagenesis in protein engineering? We have talked throughout, we talked about many of such applications, but Mutagenesis used for modifying proteins, replacement on protein level, mutation on DNA level. Your hypothesis natural sequence can be modified to improve a certain function of protein. This further implies protein is not at an optimum for that function, which is not exactly true because, as we have explained in, at the initial level, that for an protein or for an enzyme, it is not that nature did not make the smartest one, nature sometime put restriction because the restriction is critical for maintenance of the life. Sequence changes without disruption of the structure otherwise it would not fold and we would not get the protein. New sequence is not too different from the native sequence otherwise loss in function of protein as we discussed that when we are using nature's creation, nature had made some boundaries and we could not go beyond those boundaries. To go beyond those boundaries, what we need the de novo design which we discussed earlier. The consequence is introduction of point mutation which might lead to new function. So, you make change in amino acids 1, 2, 3, 4 amino acids and you see that this would alter the activity you might get thermostable protein, you might get enhanced enzyme activity or many other things. So, there are different approaches of site directed mutagenesis, point mutation in particular known area, the result would be library of wild type and mutated DNA which are site specific, which is not really a library, it would be just between two species. Random mutagenesis, point mutation in all areas within DNA of interest. Result library of wild type and mutated DNA, uh, a real library many variants which need screening. So, when you go for rational protein design, your requirement is knowledge of sequence and preferable structure, active sites, secondary catalytic residues, loop flexibility and many more you should understand the mechanism if it is working with a enzyme, knowledge about structure function relationship and identification of partners like cofactors, other interacting macromolecules etcetera. Site directed mutagenesis as we told you develop a restriction site, you cut the enzyme with restriction enzyme, then you could do exonuclease digestion and ligation to go to the small deletion or you cut with restriction enzyme, you introduce synthetic oligonucleotide and by ligation you could go to inserted fragment. So, there are multiple possibilities, you could use mutagenic cassette DNA which contain multiple changes. So, you go to a collection of different oligos. 
So, you use expression vector containing wild type sequence, you use restrictions and you do ligation with mutagenic cassette and then assay, do the assessment. There are different type of uh, mutagenesis, one is overlap extension where in the step 1 you do PCR, you create the mutation like here, you use 4 primers, 2 PCRs you have to take 2 double stranded fragments containing the desired mutagenic codon. In step 2 you also have to perform PCR non mutated primer set which will not make any mutation, but amplifies the mutagenic DNA into many folds. Also you could use whole plasmid in single round of PCR, uh, you use mutagenic primer introduce the mutation do the extension you get the mutagenic as well as wild type plasmid you do dpn1 digestion for the parent and then you anneal it by using ligase and then continue with so in step 1 mutant strand synthesis perform thermal cycling to denature the DNA template, anneal the mutagenic primers containing desired mutation, extend and incorporate primers with our exclusive uh, PFU based DNA polymerase bend and your total reaction time is 2 hours. Then you digest with DPN1, you digest the because you have the mixture, so you digest the parental methylated and hemimethylated DNA with new DPN1 enzyme. The total reaction time is 5 minutes. At the end in the step 3 you do transformation, you transform the mutated molecule into competent cell for NIC repair which is a reaction time of 1.5 hour and by this you make the whole plasmid single round PCR. And at the end we come to application already, we have talked about the application definitely engineering novel protein is one of the unique contribution coming through rational protein designing. So, yes our initial target is to develop a novel protein, but then next step is to also to get novel function. We first we want to get a nicely folded protein, but then we also want to see the protein working. A common strategy of point mutation is to make industrially stable suitable protein which means the protein is stable towards high temperature, towards different range of pH, towards denaturants, towards uh, salt and many other things. Optimizing protein production also be could be a part of uh, protein engineering, some proteins they do not express well. If you look at the protein, model the protein, you find by there are some flexible regions, you cut out those flexible regions which make the protein more working as a rigid body and that would definitely enhance your protein production. Changing oligomer state as I was talking about in case of a nanobody, but like if you take a motif structure motif from a protein called P53 which have a motif which from tetramer, you use that protein and that motif and fuse it with other protein which form a single like monomer, the monomer protein would form a tetramer. So, that is called changing oligomeric state then understanding change in function with alteration of amino acid, this is a very common method as I told, you do point mutation, you express the protein and you check its process by this way we generally uh, do a lot of work. Last but not the least, we want to understand nature strategy, let us say one of the best example of, of my work is antimyotic resistance, nature continuously change the critical genes which contribute to antibiotic resistance, how nature is doing it, if we could do that, if we could understand that through laboratory mutational studies, it will help us to develop therapeutics which will be less prone to the resistance. 
So, in short we have discussed about protein designing the one of the beauty of this class we have discussed about de novo protein designing this is a demand of new era a lot of new work is coming on this is opening the horizon I hope I have talked about the processes and talked about the details how they are done in addition to that I talked about fusioning of domains uh, point mutation or mutagenesis like deletion insertion all of this contribute to alteration the function. I hope you will like this class thank you very much.